Alright guys, so today we're going to be starting a new build series. Uh, we're going to be starting, um, or we're going to be retrofitting this cart you see here. Um, so it's actually, the back end has been redone once before on it, but now we're going to be redoing the front end, uh, basically cutting from about here to here off, and then putting a whole new front suspension on to match the better performing rear suspension that was put on it before. But uh, that'll be in a different video. Uh, today's video is going to be actually be about uh, we're going to rebuild the engine back here. Um, just been kind of not performing as well as it has been lately. So uh, we're going to rebuild that and uh, hope you learn something on the way. This engine's from a, a snowmobile just like our other one. Uh, you know, we're from Minnesota, so these things are basically a dime a dozen. So. This engine's from a 1993 uh, Polaris XLT triple. We got this engine a, a couple of years ago in a, a burned down sled, um, and it never got rebuilt, and it had close to 10,000 miles on it, so I'm, it's about time to do for a rebuild since uh, you know it's leaking a lot of stuff from here. It's, um, around on the clutch side, it's leaking a lot of uh, grease and gunk and stuff is coming out of it, but uh, it just... The whole engine needs to get reworked because it doesn't uh, it doesn't seem to have the power that it used to, and it just doesn't run as well as it used to either. So, and you can see here that this is the primary clutch we've talked about in our previous videos. This is instead of running a a uh, crotch rocket or a motorcycle engine with gears, we'll just run a clutch here. Then there'll be another one either on the front or the back, but. Uh, you know, it's a triple cylinder, so that was kind of something new that came in the 90s. So, scroll through here, but I'm, you know, surprised this engine even still runs with only, you know, seven, let alone has as much power as it does with only 75, 80 PSI of compression. I mean, I can just take the, take the clutch here and just spin it. And you can probably hear all the air leaking out of the cylinders. I could just spin it without any trouble at all. So... This thing's due for a rebuild. All right guys, so we got the engine down here and we're gonna start by taking this uh, coolant cover off. And uh, one of the interesting things about this uh, engine here is the coolant jackets and the head are not actually the same piece. So you'll see when I get this purple thing off that uh, this is just the coolant cover. But uh, um, this engine was also kind of a uh, R&D development platform uh, back in the early 90s so uh, as you could see before it's got three cylinders on it and uh, which is a pretty new thing in the 90s uh, um, they don't do this anymore because they figured out how to get the benefits uh, of a triple out of a two-cylinder now so obviously the main benefit was um, increased power for the same displacement but uh, they don't do that anymore because they figured out how to get the same power with the only two cylinders now. So you'll see when I get this off what, what I'm talking about. So we got the, the coolant jacket off. You can see it's up uh, up over here. Um, so you can see these ports where the, the coolant's coming through here. And uh, it was also kind of cool and not very common on these engines now is uh, the one great big cylinder head. So typically on these engines now or something similar, they, they'll have individual heads on them now. And even, even the jugs all, you can see down here, the jugs all one great big piece too. So you can see here now another interesting thing about this engine is 
it's got no head gasket in it. You know, there's just the only thing there is only thing keeping making the seal is you can see right on the edge these o-rings the only thing that was another thing that was kind of new for the time so i think i figured out why the uh it was leaking like a sieve all that grease was coming out of the the head or all the exhaust gaskets just got all these they're just so wore out they got all these holes in them this is another crazy thing that I can't believe the engine's even running after like this. I don't know if you can hear it, but I can actually move the piston in there. Yeah, and even all the cylinders are like that. I'm surprised the engine even still runs. All right, guys, so we finally got the engine split apart. Uh, we didn't film it. We didn't bother filming it because it was just going to take too long. We had to do a couple things to get the to get the cylinder banks split from the case but uh uh like i said before this was a two-stroke engine so if you don't know what that means we'll uh we'll show you now so uh you could see all these holes in the bore um that's because the 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 two-stroke engines they don't have valves the piston is the valve so if you see these two ports on the top um air fuel and oil will all go through there and then it'll come down into the crankcase here um down in into here and it'll lubricate the the crankshaft and then the 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 bore and then it'll come up through the the bottom um up through th these ports here and then into these four side ports <laughs> So that'd be the intake, and then it'll come out the exhaust here. So um, instead of having valves on the on the head and running a power stroke every four uh, engine cycles, um, it only runs a power stroke every two. So hence the name, a two-stroke or a four-stroke engine. Um, so now that we got this split apart, um, we're gonna set the ring gap right now, and then we're. I'm uh, gonna get this thing put back together. All right, guys. So in case you didn't really know how a, a two-stroke works, I didn't make myself too clear when we were looking at the cylinder bank. Uh, here's a diagram of a, a cross section. So this is uh, that intake, that big intake port on the bottom that your carburetor will connect to, or your. Uh, sometimes you'll have fuel injection, but not normally on a two-stroke engine. But anyways, your fuel air mixture will come through here, and keep in mind that the crankcase oil, or basically just the engine oil, is mixed in normally with the fuel. And so what happens is that'll come in through here. Your intake air or mixture will come down, and some of the oil will separate and lubricate your crankshaft, and then the rest of it will lubricate your cylinder walls and then get burned off in the process. So as the piston comes down, your intake will come in and then come out this port the intake to the cylinder um, those are those four wall four holes that we saw in the cylinder wall and then it'll get compressed have your power stroke just the same as a any other four stroke engine and it'll come out the exhaust um, so you can probably see this already, but one of the problems with a two-stroke engine is you have your intake and your exhaust open at the same time. And so what happens is some of your intake charge will leak out your exhaust. And that's, you know, unburnt fuel and air and you're losing power. And on top of that, uh, you'll get, you get uh, low compression ratios because you have uh, all this air flowing through the engine. So two-stroke engines normally only have like a six and a half, you know, seven to one compression ratio versus a four-stroke can be as high as 12 to 13 to one. So to fix this problem, what uh, they end up doing is they put these weird uh, exhaust pipes on. You've probably seen it in our previous videos. If you've ever seen a two-stroke, you'll know what I'm talking about. But what happens is the exhaust pipe is small. Uh, when it's connected to the engine, it'll get big and then it'll get small again on the... Um, when it connects to the muffler or whatever it is. Um, so the reason for this is because when the high pressure or high pressure exhaust gas comes out of the engine, um, some of it will leave the end of the 
at this small end of the exhaust pipe and then some of it will actually get reflected back into the down the pipe and back into the engine and the reason for this is because um, at the same time you're having air come into the engine and instead of having this uh, air fuel mixture leak out through the exhaust now you have this high pressure air that got reflected back um, won't let that come out and then so you can keep all that air fuel mixture in the engine and you'll get more power that way and on top of that um, you also get a higher compression ratio too because um, now your exhaust you know since air won't leak out of your exhaust it kinda creates a uh, almost an extension of the cylinder wall and on every two-stroke engine the um, exhaust port is always higher than the intake so what this happens is you'll get the this uh, dynamic compression ratio instead of being like six and a half to seven to one uh, like it normally would be just sitting here uh, you'll get like a 12 or 13 to one uh, just like a four stroke and uh, because of that um, you'll have these uh, uh, high compression ratios you'll be making more power but you also have twice as many power strokes too as you will with a four stroke engine and that's generally the reason why um, two stroke engines will make more power for the same displacement as four strokes but uh, keep in mind that this pipe um, when it's reflecting gas back or exhaust gas back to uh, keep the intake charge from uh, flowing through um, it only works at the resonant frequency of the pipe so it only works at a certain RPM range maybe um, you know you might only have a band of about 1500 RPMs where this actually works and what happens is it gives the the two-stroke its characteristic power band so what happens is um, the two strokes end up making quite a bit you know a lot more power at a certain RPM range than they do normally so we're here setting the ring gap and you can see uh, th we got the ring seated in the cylinder and uh, this is the old ring and you can see how big that gap is it's about uh, a little bit bigger than a sixteenth of an inch which is way 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 too big and so we got the new ring here um, uh, you can see the gap uh, on the cylinder is way tighter um, now when you do this you're going to want to put your feeler gauges in here and measure to see which one's just like that measure to see which one is uh, what the correct thickness is and uh, you're going to want to put your rings in each of the cylinders depending on how big the gap is usually the manufacturer will have the spec on what they're supposed to be at normally uh, right around the 15 thousandths or so but this engine is uh, the ring gap can be set to anywhere between 8 and 20 thousandths. So now that we've got the ring set, um, I measured the ring gap on each one of these cylinders and uh, f found uh, the gap that was tightest on all of them. Uh, they're not going to be quite exactly the same. They, they varied by one or two thousandths depending on the cylinder. So now that we've got that uh, the rings measured, we just install them on the on the pistons now so we just so we know which ones are there and now the next thing to do is cross hatch the cylinders um, what this is is you can kinda see how the there's none left in here uh, so what cross hatching is is um, basically at a 45 degree angle it's just little tiny scratches inside the cylinder wall that hold the oil better so it basically kind of impregnates oil into the wall and you can kind of see that right now we have just uh, straight lines so they're worn out so we're just going to take a little scotch bright and some WD-40 and uh, scuff these up a little bit now it's very important that you don't overdo it but you want to have enough so it'll hold the oil and if you do it right it'll they'll uh, be at a 45 degree angle so we'll come in this way first and then come back this way after we've done that now you won't be able to feel these scratches but you'll be able to see them and it'll 
the oil will stick to the cylinder walls better. So I've just gone through with a scotch bright and I rubbed the inside of the cylinders with some WD-40 and now I've cleaned it all out and you can see just barely this little X pattern in here. Now that's for, uh, that's what I was talking about when you want to cross hatch the cylinder. So that uh, provides extra surface area for the oil to stick and you can get a lot better seal and better compression when you got a good cross hatching in. Alright, so we got the cylinder bank put back onto this, uh, to the crankcase, and it was actually really difficult even for two people, so we didn't film it, um, just because you wouldn't be able to see anything anyways. But what we had to do is we had to run each cylinder at a time, uh, compress the rings, and then uh, pop it through, and then rotate the crank to move the cylinders one by one, but we we shimmed the crankcase and the and the uh, cylinder bank and just gradually dropped it down as we got cylinders in, but you can, yeah, it definitely has a lot better seal than it did now, I don't know if you can hear, if you guys can hear this on the video, but even on the intake stroke, it's got, you can hear it just sucking the air in, so I don't know if you can hear this. Even just without a head on, you can, it's sucking air in way better than it did before. All right, guys, so we got the rest of the engine put together. Um, we got the water pump on, or the coolant cover, the header, and then uh, the water pump down here. Um, we did make a couple of changes to the engine, too. Uh, most notably, the pressure release. Uh, we That was here, we replaced it with just aluminum plate, so now we're only using the pressure release on the uh, radiator. And uh, here's the old one. Um, we kind of had some problems before with it, you know, leaking coolant out and spraying coolant, but then none would come off of the pressure release on the top of the uh, radiator, which was kind of weird. Uh, what we think may have caused that was this belt here that drives the water pump was not tight at all. So maybe it just wasn't circulating water as fast as it should, or it wasn't, uh, you know, having enough you know, total output volume. So pretty much the only thing left is to go through the carburetors. Uh, we got one sitting here and then we just put the ignition coils and the pull start back on, which you got laying here. All right, guys, so we got the engine all the way put back together. You can see the recoils on and the carburetors are on. Now the, the throttle bodies or the, the slides are connected to the throttle cable, which is still in the car. That's why the tops are empty, but we got the uh coils on and everything's all put back together you know i hope you you know that the two strokes aren't nearly as common as like a four stroke uh, uh crotch rocket engine so i hope you guys at least learned something while you were watching this maybe about you know some of the engine operating theory or you know whatever but uh if you like the video uh be sure to hit the like button, uh, subscribe if you want to see more videos, and uh, if you have any suggestions for future videos, uh, leave a comment down below and we'll probably make a video on it. Alright, thanks for watching.